Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with chocolate energy bars. That's right, have you ever had low energy? So you went and bought one of those energy bars? Which helped, except now you're low money because you just paid three bucks for a couple ounces of fruit and nuts. And of course, low money can lead to low self-esteem, which of course leads to low energy, and we're right back where we started. Well, hopefully this video helps break that cycle because as you're about to see, it's pretty fast, easy, and inexpensive to make your own energy bars. So let's go ahead and get started with what is basically the secret to this whole operation, the dates. And not just any dates, we're using what's called medjool dates, which not only have a beautiful sweet flavor, but they're also nice and moist, which provides the perfect amount of stickiness with which to hold all our other ingredients together. And what we need to do to prep these is simply pull out that pit in the middle, which is very easy. We just have to break them open and pull them out. And then once our date is seeded, we'll just give it a little rough chop to make it blend a little easier, and that's it. And by the way, on the blog post, I will go over a little bit on what to do if you can't find the medjool date. You do have some options, but having said that, they are pretty easy to find. Try to look for the grocery stores that have lots of hybrids in the parking lot. They will usually carry them. But anyway, we'll go through our dates, removing that seed or pit or whatever it is. And like I said, give them a little rough chop, which may or may not be unnecessary, but I do it anyway. And once we have a couple cups of those dates prepped, we can move on to mixing this up with the rest of the ingredients, which by the way, we really wanna do in a food processor. So into that, let's go ahead and dump our raw cashews, as well as some almonds, which by the way, I did toast first. Generally, if this was being made by your typical vegan from Central Casting, this would be done with all raw ingredients, but I do prefer the flavor of the roasted almonds. And quite frankly, I don't see who I'm hurting by toasting those. Of course, I'm sure someone will let me know. But anyway, after that, we'll also add some coconut. And not the sweetened one, just pure coconut. Look on the label, it should just say coconut. And then of course we will add in our chopped dates, as well as, since we're making these chocolate energy bars, a lot of cocoa. And hopefully it's a very high quality Dutch processed cocoa. And I will let you know in the post the exact brand I used, but using a nice chocolate here is kind of a key. And then since these are energy bars, we're definitely gonna want a little bit of fat. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in a couple tablespoons of coconut oil which if you haven't worked with it before, it looks like this at room temperature. It sort of looks like shortening, but looks are deceiving. This stuff's like 100 times better for you. And to use this, we'll just zap it in the microwave for a few seconds until it melts into this liquid form. And we'll go ahead and pour that into our mixture. And not only is that gonna provide us with some energy, that fat's gonna combine with that cocoa to make this all a little more chocolatey. So we'll toss in some coconut oil, followed by a little bit of vanilla extract. Definitely the real stuff. In fact, if you knew where the artificial stuff came from, you definitely wouldn't use it. But anyway, a little touch of vanilla, followed by a tablespoon of liquid to help this all come together. And most people like to use water, but I'm actually gonna use some cold espresso, which will serve the same purpose, except this is gonna make that chocolate taste a little chocolatier. And then we will finish up with a little pinch of salt. And that is gonna be it for our chocolate energy bar ingredients. So at this point, we can head to the food processor to mix this up. Whoops, hold on, I forgot something. We can't do an energy bar without a little pinch of cayenne. So that was a good catch, we almost ruined it. And now that we finally have all the ingredients in for sure, we will head over and process this until it just sort of comes together into one mass. And as usual, we always wanna pulse on and off to start. And by the way, I should mention, I like mine kinda of chunky. I like to see and feel lots of pieces of the nuts. But if you want your smoother, you can always process the nuts first and then add the rest of the ingredients in after that. So that's up to you, but I do prefer mine chunky. So what I like to do is pulse it on and off for about a minute and then evaluate. We'll take off the lid, we'll give it a little mix with the spatula. Okay, first of all, we wanna make sure there's nothing weird going on. And there wasn't. But we also wanna check for moisture. Okay, if it seems a little dry, you can always add a little more water or coffee. But mine seemed pretty good, so I popped the lid back on and continued. And please keep in mind, like most of these videos, I'm hopefully teaching you a technique here that you'll then adapt using the ingredients you want. Okay, literally any kind of dried fruits, nuts, seeds can go in this. So there's just a ton of room for experimentation here. But anyway, we're gonna keep processing that until like I said, it kind of comes together in one mass, which is what I have right here. And once that's happened, all we need to do now is transfer this into some kind of plastic wrapped mold. And by mold, I mean any kind of pan or casserole dish. So we'll go ahead and transfer that in and use our spatula to press that down nice and even. And by the way, don't worry about trying to get it absolutely perfect here with the spatula. Just get it close. Because the next step here, we're gonna put a piece of plastic over the top. And then we'll use our hands on top of that to get this all nice and even and smoothed out the best we can. And that, my friends, is pretty much it. Except for one major thing. 
Before we try to cut this, we want to chill this thoroughly in the fridge so it gets nice and firm. Okay, it's all about significantly slowing down those molecules. So let's go ahead and wrap that up and pop that in the fridge for two or three hours or until, like I said, it gets firm enough to cut. So this is mine later that afternoon. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull that out of the pan. It should feel firmer and significantly less sticky. And once we have that unwrapped with a smoother side up, all we need to do is cut this into whatever size bars we want. So we could cut this into sort of a small snack size, or what you see me doing here, which is more of a meal replacement portion. But really, that's up to you. You are the boss of your bars. Which reminds me, you can also be the boss of your balls. Since instead of molding this in a pan, you could just take the mixture and roll it into balls, which is kind of a cool way to serve them. In fact, once formed, you can roll the balls in cocoa or coconut, and they'll kind of look like truffles. But anyway, I'm going for the more traditional bar shape. And then once those are cut, you can just store them in a Ziploc bag. I like to keep them in the fridge, but you don't have to. Or if you want to get a little bit fancy, and by fancy I mean crafty, we can just take a little square of parchment paper and sort of wrap it up in that. And then we can hold all that in place with a piece of butcher's twine. And of course I could have done that a lot neater and made it look a lot more perfect. But I wasn't going for a professional look. I wanted this to look rustic and homemade, allegedly. But anyway, just an idea for you. I think it's kind of a cool way to package them. It's going to keep them nice and fresh, plus because these things are kind of sticky, it's a nice easy way to handle them. But anyway, no matter how you package these, I believe you're going to be enjoying an energy bar that's just as good tasting, less expensive, and probably better for you. All right, our dates and cashews here provide just enough sweetness, and I really think you're going to be surprised how chocolatey this is. Which is a good thing, because this really does look like a fudge brownie. Which I guess could be one of the issues with these. Because while it looks like a fudge brownie, of course it's not going to taste like a fudge brownie. But that aside, I think this compares very, very favorably to any similar type fruit nut bar you're going to get at the store. And as you saw, if you have a food processor, these are very, very easy to make. So I really do hope you give these a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Granola. Hey, where are my hippies at? Oh, over there. Okay. Anyway, this is homemade granola, so easy and really healthy from what I hear. All right, we're going to take some brown sugar and maple syrup. And if you're wondering why I added brown sugar, maple syrup, and then more brown sugar, it's because I measured wrong, but I corrected myself. So we're going to put in brown sugar, maple syrup. We're also going to put in a little bit of vegetable oil, salt, which is very important, and we're going to stir that together. So this is the healthiest, easiest way to make granola. Some versions call for you to boil like a sugar syrup first. This is a much lighter, looser granola. Some of them are like almost like brittle, like candy. All right, we're going to add our oats, our almonds, our coconut, and our sunflower seeds. Make sure you mix it really well before we bake this. It has to be completely coated perfectly. So once you think it's coated perfectly, then do it for another two minutes. Then do it one more minute. Then pour it on a silicone lined baking sheet, which I really hope you have one of those sheets. If not, you're going to have to spray with that vegetable oil nonstick spray. That's going to go in a 250 degree oven for an hour, but there's a trick. Every 10-15 minutes, pull it out, take the tip of a fork, which I believe are called the tines, and you go just break it up, mix it around so it toasts evenly. Because what you're doing here is you're toasting the nuts, you're toasting the oatmeal so it's all beautiful, sweet, and crunchy. All right, after one hour at 250, mine was done. If you've got to go a little longer, go a little longer. All right, I'm going to scrape it into a bowl, and while it's hot, I'm going to mix in my dried fruit. So I'm going to use currants, which I love because they're small and dainty, but a lot of people, most people use raisins, any kind of dried fruit will work. Or don't put any. It's not going to bother me any. All right, once you mix that in, you're done. You can eat that as a breakfast cereal. You can just eat it like a trail mix. But what I like to do with it, a fruit and yogurt parfait. By the way, this is dedicated to Tom Tolbert from KMBR 680, the sports leader. And only he and his partner, Ralph, will know why. But this fruit and yogurt parfait is so easy to make. You just build up layers, granola, yogurt, fruit, granola, yogurt, fruit, etc. And parfait is French for like a Sunday but not as good, I believe is the translation. And that makes for a beautiful breakfast or an after-dinner treat. 
I don't even think you can buy granola this delicious. So if you never tried it, super easy. Go ahead and make that. Go to the site, get the ingredients, and as always, enjoy. The Ben Franklin Breakfast Bowl. That's right, as Benjamin Franklin used to say, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, which I do believe to be true, or at least I hope so, since I enjoy one of these beautiful breakfast bowls almost every morning. And since trying to eat better and feel better in the new year is such a popular resolution, I thought the timing was perfect to share this with you. Remember, as I've said before, the longer you live, the more ad revenue you generate. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with what's really the only work involved here, and that's to cut up one apple. And since we're gonna do this on an empty stomach, still half asleep, we're gonna need some kind of very fast, easy method, which this is. So what we're gonna do is make our first cut straight down about a quarter inch from the stem, which should just miss the seeds in the core. And once that first piece is taken off, that'll leave us with a nice flat base, and we'll position our apple as shown, and make a second cut this way straight down, again about a quarter inch away from the stem, and then we'll simply turn to make our third cut, followed by our fourth and final cut, at which point we should be looking at a fairly nicely cored apple. And then once that's set, again with the flat side down, we will cut up our apple into small cubes by slicing across and then turning and cutting across the other way into whatever size we want. And normally at this point, I'll say pick a size and stick with it. But since we're not cooking this, having these pieces all the same size doesn't really matter although it is good practice. So try to get them close, just for me. And by the way, for my Ben Franklin breakfast bowls, I always chill the apples. Okay, I want them very cold and very crisp. So if you remember, go ahead and pop those in the fridge the night before. But that's optional and up to you. All right, you are after all the founding father of whether to bother, but I do think this is better if the apples are nice and cold. But anyway, once cut, we'll go ahead and transfer those into a bowl and move on to the second most important ingredient, some plain yogurt. And I'm gonna go into detail on the blog, but I'm using sheep's milk yogurt, which is my favorite. And we really don't need to or want to use a yogurt that has added sugar to it. So I am recommending the plain yogurt here. And if you're keeping score at home, I'm using one six ounce container. And then once our yogurt's been spooned on and seductively swirled, we will top with a few tablespoons of granola. And besides trying to eat a nice healthy breakfast every morning, my other New Year's resolution is try to learn how to focus the camera. But anyway, we'll go ahead and add a couple spoons of granola for some extra sweetness and of course, some crunchy texture. And that, my friends, is pretty much it for my basic Ben Franklin breakfast bowl that I enjoy almost every morning, like probably four to five days a week. But if we want, we are allowed to garnish with a few extra little seasonal items. All right, in my case, I'm gonna finish this one off with a little bit of diced persimmon, as well as a few chopped up roasted almonds. And because we are trying to keep this light and nutritious, you are allowed to accessorize this with any kind of fresh fruit you want, as well as the nuts and seeds of your choice. But what you want to try to stay away from is dried fruit, which will tend to add a lot of sugar and calories. And since we really don't need the extra sweetness, and we already have plenty of fiber, dried fruit is something I tend to avoid. And along the same lines, you do not need to drizzle this with honey or maple syrup or anything like that. All right, I promise you it's going to be absolutely delicious served as is. So let me go ahead and grab a spoon and dig in. And what I enjoy so much about this is the contrast not only between the flavors, but also the textures. All right, we have that cold, juicy, crispy sweet apple, which pairs perfectly with our creamy, slightly tarry yogurt. And then as far as texture goes, we have that crunch from our granola and chopped nuts, keeping things interesting. And for a bowl of food that probably comes in somewhere between 300 and 400 calories, this is very satisfying and relatively filling. And only takes a couple minutes to put together. Right, your average fast food drive through wait time is about four and a half minutes. So not only is this significantly better for you, it's just as fast and comes with much less shame and guilt. All right, so there's nothing wrong with the occasional drive through breakfast sandwich. But as far as a regular morning routine, I'm thinking that this breakfast bowl is probably a better way to go. And I'm pretty sure the ghost of Benjamin Franklin would agree. In fact, if he does, knock twice. Close enough. So for those reasons and more, I really do hope you give this a try soon. And head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.
chocolate almond breakfast donuts. That's right, I'm gonna show you how to make gluten-free, grain-free, low-carb, high-protein donuts that are healthy enough to eat for breakfast without all the guilt and shame. And you might be thinking, that sounds great, but they must taste terrible like all quote-unquote healthy donuts. Well, that's the thing, they don't. They taste good, really good, especially covered in chocolate. But we'll get into all the loopholes later. For now, let's get started with one of the easiest batters we've ever done, which is gonna start with two whole large eggs, to which we will add a couple tablespoons of vegetable oil or the liquid fat of your choice. Okay, I went with something neutral in flavor here, but you could do melted butter or coconut oil, or speaking of healthy, extra virgin olive oil. And then we are gonna to need to sweeten this up a little bit. And for that, I'm gonna use some maple syrup. And that's it, we'll go ahead and take a whisk and mix this very enthusiastically for a couple minutes until everything becomes beautifully emulsified and a little bit foamy. Oh, and if you wanted to add a little bit of vanilla extract here, that would be fine. And I actually did in one of the test batches. And to be honest, I really didn't notice a big difference. So I'll leave that up to you. But anyway, once we have that mixed up, we'll stop and move on to the dry ingredients. Starting with the most important, some finely ground almond flour. And by the way, not all almond flours are ground the same way. So if you want yours to come out exactly like mine using the same amount, you're gonna have to get yours from a guy named Bob who lives in a red mill down by the river. But having said that, anything ground similar to this should work out fine. And then we'll finish this off with some baking powder, a little bit of salt, and then a couple spoons of a high quality Dutch processed cocoa. Oh yeah, that's the pretty one that has that beautiful deep red brown color. And then once everything's been bowled, we'll take a spatula and give this a thorough mixing. And if you're wondering, why didn't you mix up all the dry ingredients first, like you usually do? Or at the very least, break up all those clumps of almond meal? Well, that is a good question. And that's because almond flour does not contain any gluten. So there is absolutely no danger in overmixing this batter. Okay, you could mix this for an hour and nothing bad would happen, other than maybe a sore shoulder. But anyway, the point is we will mix that fearlessly until all that almond flour has disappeared, at which point we can set that aside and we'll move on to prep our donut pan, which looks like this. And they say this is already nonstick, but they say a lot of things. So to hedge our bets, we will also give this a generous spray with some vegetable oil. And yes, you can just brush that in instead or use some softened butter. And then the easiest way to get our batter into the pan would be to transfer it into a piping bag or one of these plastic zip top bags. And I don't do a lot of freeze frames, but I'm gonna do one here, since I was just about to use my finger to clean off the spatula, which would have been a bad idea, since this batter is extremely sticky. So what we really wanna do is use the inside of the bag to wipe off the spatula, thereby keeping our fingers nice and clean. And then once that's been transferred in, and we've sorta of pushed it all together, we will take our scissors and cut about an inch off the corner. And that should allow us to very efficiently and effectively, and without making a big mess, transfer this into our pan. Oh, and did I mention these are also high fiber? At least compared to a regular donut. But anyway, we'll go ahead and pipe in our batter as evenly as we can. And in a perfect world, when we got to that last one, we would have used up all our batter. But that world has not been discovered yet. And we're probably gonna be left with a little bit still in the bag. So we will just go around adding a little more to each one, wherever we think it makes sense. And then once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and use our finger to press down and even out the tops but not with a dry finger, right? We're gonna to wanna to dip it in water first, since as I mentioned, this batter is extremely sticky. And that's it, once we have all our batter pressed down and evenly distributed, we'll go ahead and give that the old tapa tapa on the counter to settle that batter down even more, at which point these are ready to transfer into the center of a 375 degree oven for about nine or 10 minutes or until they look like this. But as you know, we try not to go by looks in the kitchen. So we'll wanna to check to make sure a skewer comes out clean, which mine did. And then what we need to do is let these sit in the pan for 10 minutes so they don't break apart when we turn them out. So we will wait 600 seconds, at which point we should be able to safely turn over the pan to reveal some pretty gorgeous looking donuts and some relatively light ones at that. Okay, some of these almond flour recipes are super dense and heavy, but this one was not. And then like virtually every delicious baked good we wanna eat right away, we cannot eat this one right away. For best results, we really do wanna let these cool down to room temp, which is fine, because that's gonna give us time to decorate these, which I'm gonna do first by dipping the tops in some melted chocolate, 
And contrary to popular belief, if you use a nice high percentage chocolate, it really doesn't contain a lot of sugar. And don't even get me started on the antioxidants. And yes, believe it or not, additional fiber. So if you can, try to use something that's like 70 or 80% cacao, even though I'm cheating and using something that's 63. But anyway, I went ahead and dipped those in chocolate and then smoothed out the tops a little bit with a spoon before I moved on to garnishing the tops. And for that, I'm going to do a couple dipped in toasted coconut flakes. And if you're a fan of the good old-fashioned Almond Joy candy bar, I think that would be the way to go. So I did two with coconut and then moved on to do a couple more with chopped almonds. And I was originally going to use sliced, but then I thought it looked too similar to the coconut, and I decided to do them roughly chopped instead. And by the way, while your chocolate coating is still wet, you are able to do any kind of adjusting and fine-tuning you want. And then for the two middle ones, I was just going to leave those plain chocolate, but after looking at the garnishes on either side, I decided they needed a little something. So I went around and applied a few chocolate chips. Which, by the way, Michelle thought was a big mistake. She thought those were redundant, unnecessary, and distracting. But anyway, you decide. I mean, you are after all the Samuel Morris, of whether your donut looks like a stegosaurus. But regardless of what you garnish with, we're going to want to let those donuts cool completely, and for that chocolate on top to firm up before we serve. But once it does, we can go ahead and bite in. And that, my friends, considering the ingredients we used, is a pretty impressive chocolate donut. All right, lots of chocolatey flavor. And even though it makes up most of the batter, the flavor of almond does not overpower everything else. And here you can see they have a very similar crumb and texture to a regular cake donut, which reminds me that's not what you're supposed to compare these to. I mean, come on, we didn't use flour or butter or white sugar. So to compare these to a regular chocolate donut is not really fair. What these should be compared to are those expensive, uninteresting, virtually tasteless, energy bars a lot of people eat for breakfast. Okay, these are way better than those. But anyway, I finished up that coconut version. And then I went ahead and plated up one with the chopped almonds so I could get some shots of it in its natural habitat next to a nice hot cup of coffee. I'm going to go ahead and finish up with one final test. Will it dunk? And yes, it dunks. It dunks real good. But whether you dip or just bite and sip, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Minute Steak and Egg with Red Hot Butter Sauce. That's right, there are more than one breakfast of champions. And unless you're training for a cereal eating contest, I would go with this one. And besides learning what might become your new favorite breakfast, if you pay attention, you're also going to pick up a couple bonus tips, like how to make cheap steak taste like expensive steak, and how to cook the perfect fried egg. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our top sirloin. And for one serving, I'm going to suggest we use a 6-ounce piece of sirloin, which I'm going to get by cutting this 12-ounce piece in half, which I could do across like this, but thicker pieces are harder to pound than thinner pieces. So I'm actually going to turn it on its side and cut it in half like this. And by the way, this is not a game of speed, so take your time and slice that in two as evenly as you can. And of course, you can save this step and just have your butcher cut you six ounce pieces. So don't be afraid to ask them, they will do it. And then once we have what I think are the perfect size portions, we will go ahead and sandwich this piece between two pieces of plastic. And we will attempt to pound this out to about a quarter inch thick. And the good news about using top sirloin is that it's usually about half the price of the more expensive cuts like New York or ribeye or filet mignon. Or it's probably a third of the price of filet mignon. But the bad news is it's very lean, which means it's not as tender or flavorful, which is why we're going to pound it nice and thin. Okay, so that takes care of the not being tender problem. And now that that's about a quarter inch thick, we can work on making it more flavorful, which we'll do by generously seasoning both sides with salt and freshly ground black pepper, plus a light but very important sprinkling of breadcrumbs. All right, not a super thick coating, just a few teaspoons per side. And once those have been applied, to make sure they're attached to the meat, I think we should hit this with the meat pounder for a few seconds. And not only is that going to give this a better texture once it's seared and bring a little bit of crustiness to the party, but somehow, some way, I also think it makes this taste better as well. Oh, and please note, I am using the fine breadcrumbs, not the panko style which I think would work 
But because of the short cooking time, I think the finer the crumb, the better. So we will season and crumb both sides, at which point our minute steak is ready to cook for about a minute per side. And we'll do that in a pan set over high heat, into which we're going to spoon a couple tablespoons of clarified butter, which as you know is just melted butter with that white foamy stuff skimmed off. And one of the keys to a minute steak, besides pounding the meat nice and thin, is that we have to let this butter get smoking hot before we add the steak to the pan. So we will stand right there observing carefully. And as soon as that clarified butter just starts to smoke, we will quickly but very carefully lay our steak in the pan, at which point we will cook it for about a minute per side. And of course, that depends on how thick you pounded your meat and also your desired doneness level. So I only went for about a minute, 15 seconds per side. And as soon as we flip that over, we can reduce our heat a little bit down to like medium high, since that pan is super hot. But anyway, we'll give that second side about a minute, or until we see a little bit of pink juice pool on the top. And that's it, I like to give it one last flip to sear that juice onto the pan, at which point we'll turn off the heat and we'll transfer that to a warm plate and we'll reserve it while we cook our perfect fried egg. And what I like to do is let that pan cool for about 30 seconds or so during which time we'll add another teaspoon of clarified butter and we'll turn our heat back on to medium and we will transfer one large egg into the pan, which I like to crack in a ramekin to make sure the yolk's not broken. Speaking of which, as soon as that's in the pan, I like to take the edge of a spoon or a spatula and break through that membrane that holds the white together, which has a name, which I don't know, so I just call it the membrane. And what's gonna happen is that egg white's gonna run to the other side and it's not only going to make our yolk centered, so it looks nice on the plate, but now all our egg whites the same thickness, which means it's going to cook very uniformly. And it's that little simple move there that's the secret to a perfectly fried egg. Oh, and yes, we definitely want to give this a pinch of salt. And that's it. We'll cook this on medium until the edges and bottom are nice and browned and crispy. And that white is cooked through, which it almost was at this point, but not quite. And then our yolk, of course, should be warm, but definitely not cooked through. Since if you're not going to make this with a runny egg, what is the point? In fact, if you've never been able to do a runny egg, please, I beg you, make this the recipe where you try it. Trust me, you will never go back. And that's it. Once the egg is cooked to our liking, we'll go ahead and turn off the heat and place that on our steak. And then we'll finish up by making one of the greatest two-ingredient sauces of all time, which involves one chunk of butter and a tablespoon or two of Louisiana hot sauce. And all we have to do is swirl those things together in the hot pan, and that butter will melt and emulsify into that acidic sauce. And that's it, we're ready to top our minute steak and egg. Oh, and in the spirit of full disclosure, on the way to the plate, I did stir in a couple teaspoons of water, since by the time I moved the tripod and camera, the heat in the pan had sort of dried the sauce out. So what I'm trying to say is maybe stir a couple teaspoons of water into yours as well especially if it looks like it's too dry or separated. And then once we have that sauce, we can finish up with some chives or some green onions, or in my case, some really small green onions that look like chives. And those landed in the perfect spots, except for that one big piece. So I went ahead and did a little what I call fat finger food styling. And I got everything exactly where I wanted. And after taking a few contractually obligated pictures, I grabbed a fork and knife and dug in. And I started by busting that egg right in the yolk and spread over what is basically the second sauce. And that, my friends, was just simply incredible. Right, that meat was perfectly pink and nice and juicy. And as far as the texture goes, it was every bit as tender as a steak twice or three times the price. And while it doesn't have quite the same amount of breading as like a chicken fried steak would, that little bit of starch on the surface from the breadcrumb does wonderful things, both texturally and flavor-wise. And it's just a nicer experience than if we'd cooked the meat plain. And I do think a nice vinegary, Louisiana-style hot sauce works great here. But you could easily switch that out for your favorite Asian hot sauce. And I think it would be equally magnificent. But anyway, those type of tweaks are up to you. I mean, you guys are after all the Jane Campions of your breakfast of champions. And speaking of Westerns, I think this would be really nice with some fire-roasted chilies. Or if we go even further west to California, a few slices of avocado would be beautiful as well. So this is something you can definitely embellish if you want. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling minute steak and egg. This thing was one piece of toast away from perfection. And yes, we're putting the minute in quotations since it doesn't take literally a minute to cook. Okay, it's like when you tell someone to hang on for a second. It's kind of like that. 
but the point is it is super fast and very easy, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Raw kale salad. That's right. I'm going to show you how to take this fairly tough, fairly bitter green and turn it into a delicious green salad. And these raw kale salads are very trendy right now. Very popular, sweeping the nation, which makes it kind of surprising I'm doing a video recipe for it because I usually don't like to jump on the bandwagon and just do recipes because they're popular. In fact, for example, I'm not doing a cake pops video until 2017. But anyway, despite its trendiness, this is such a great technique and such a delicious and healthy idea. I just had to show you, okay? So I have one bunch of kale. Of course, this has been thoroughly washed and dried. All right, dirty and or wet greens, not a great idea for any kind of salad recipe. And the first step in the prep is to remove the very, very tough stem from the tender leaves. And actually that's not quite true. The leaves aren't that tender, but they're way more tender than that stem, which I don't even think is actually a stem. I think it's a rib. But anyway, this step is very simple. Take the stem in one hand, and with your other hand, simply strip off the leafy greens. It's actually very quick and easy. And really, that's all there is to it. Not a lot of tricks to this. Just strip them off. So to recap, remove tough, inedible stems. Save and reserve the leaves. All right, once the leaves are prepped, we're going to go to phase two, which is the slicing. So I want you to grab a small handful of the leaves, kind of wad them up, roll them up tightly, and then take a nice big sharp knife and just simply slice it across. I'm going about every quarter inch or so. You could even go a little thinner if you want, but I wouldn't go much bigger. And that really is the secret of this technique. By cutting into these nice thin ribbons, which I guess we could call chiffonading. But by cutting it like this, you're breaking it down enough where it will mix with our other ingredients in the salad. And you won't even know you're eating raw bitter greens. And you'll see, once this is all mixed up, it is incredibly, incredibly delicious. And quite a textural treat. So we're going to prep our kale. We're going to throw it in a nice big bowl. And then it's time to think about what other ingredients we want to put in here. So because kale is kind of a tough and bitter green, what really works well with it is sweet and crunchy. So I had some nice ripe persimmons. I should do a video on persimmons. I'll do that someday. So some sliced persimmons. I also slivered a nice crisp apple on my vegetable slicer. All right, that's going to be perfect in here. I highly suggest you put some kind of crunchy nuts in this. I usually use roasted almonds, but I had some pumpkin seeds, which I thought would be really good in this, and they were. So I'm going to put a big handful of that in. And then for the dressing, I'm going to use an orange and cumin vinaigrette. But really, any of your favorite salad dressings will work here. But as I mentioned, sweet does work good with bitter. So I really do like a citrus-based dressing for this. I think it works very, very well. And yes, I am going to give you the recipe for that on the blog. And I'm also going to do a video for a very cool technique for making that dressing. So stay tuned for that. So we're going to pour over the dressing. That's to taste, of course. You put as much as you want. But this is definitely a salad you want well-dressed. I'm going to take my tongs. I'm going to mix that up thoroughly. And of course, you can always add more. So I generally start off a little conservative, give it a mix, then I'll evaluate. And right here I was thinking, hmm, needs another spoon just to be safe. So I put a little more in, gave it a final toss, and that raw kale salad is pretty much done. I'm going to pile that in a bowl. And then for the final touch, to just put this over the top, some perfectly segmented orange supremes. You know how to do those, right? We have a video. So that's just pure orange flesh, no membranes to get in the way. All right, a few more nuts on top just for good luck. And that is one magnificent looking raw kale salad. So unless you're part goat, just sitting in front of a bowl of kale is not going to be very appetizing. But when you combine it with those crisp sweet apples, those beautiful juicy oranges, the crunchy nuts, the way that bitter plays off the sweet and then the tanginess from the dressing. I mean, as far as salads go, it's kind of exciting stuff. And fun fact, if you eat two of these a week, you will live longer. True story. So if you're into longevity, try to work this into your regular rotation of salads. You can actually do a classic Caesar using this instead of romaine. All right, you can use this in your favorite coleslaw recipe. Just so many directions you can go with this technique. So I hope you're going to get all wild and crazy with this and do some really super interesting, delicious things and then share them with me. And then I'll steal your idea and take credit for it. Hey, you do it to me. Turnabout's fair play. So I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Broccoli salad. So simple, so refreshing, so delicious. And I hear 
although I'm no expert. I hear it's good for you. So here's how I put this together. We're gonna take a pound and a half of fresh broccoli. I like to cut just a little end off there. Usually it's kind of a little dry and ugly. We're gonna cut the stem in quarters. And then very important, when you cut the tops of broccoli, turn it this way and go right down the middle and then in quarters. Don't worry what the tops look like. You gotta get the stems even, because that's what you need to cook evenly. So there we go. So it's all separated. Like I said, the stems you want sort of uniform. The tops does not matter. We're gonna take a large pot of boiling salted water, and I'm gonna boil those for about five to six minutes. Results may vary. All right, so you gotta kind of play it by ear. Take a little paring knife. When the stem are just starting to get tender, there's still a little resistance there. They're not soft. They're still just a little bit firm. We're gonna take those out, put them in some very cold water. I don't waste my ice when I do blanched vegetables. Very cold water works. In a restaurant with an ice machine, sure. Go ahead, throw a scoop of ice in there. But at home, save the ice for the cocktails. All right, when we drain these, we're gonna put the flour side down so the water runs out. If you just put them any old way, those heads are kind of like sponges. They really trap the water. So I like to drain them like that. Set that aside. Make sure they drain at least a half hour. The dressing, so simple. Lots of garlic, fresh lemon juice, rice vinegar, some salt, a little bit of pepper. I know what you think's coming next. Cayenne, wrong. Red chili flakes. A little bit of Dijon. We're going to whisk that up, and then we're going to drizzle in some olive oil. All the amounts will be on the site. Make sure you get those critical measurements. Okay, you're going to whisk in your oil, and you're going to have a beautiful emulsified dressing. You know the drill. Very slow at first. Once it starts to come together and thickens, then you can add a little quicker. My broccoli is drained. Very well drained. Wet broccoli, no good. We're going to toss that with our dressing. Now here's the trick. The florets really will soak up that dressing. So you want to make sure it's all evenly mixed. So I give it a toss, I let it sit for five minutes, and then I toss it again. Now, it's perfect to serve like this. In fact, it's beautiful served like this. Or you can refrigerate for up to a half hour, hour max. Otherwise, it starts to break down. This is not something you want to marinate and you know leave in the fridge forever. So toss it relatively close to when you're going to eat, and you will be happy. I kind of put my florets around in a little circle. I put the stems in the middle. That's my presentation. Get your own or use mine. You'll notice I'm in the window here. The sun was going in and out of the clouds, so that's why uh, you get that light effect here. It's all part of the show. I like to finish with a little red chili flake. And there you go. Cold broccoli salad with a spicy lemon garlic dressing. Incredibly simple, amazing side dish for all your summer barbecues or cookouts or whatever. I hope you give that a try. All the ingredients are on the site. And as always, enjoy. Smash cucumber salad. That's right, out of all the various culinary techniques, I would say smashing is probably the easiest to learn and most fun. And by utilizing this very primitive technique, we're not only gonna relieve a little bit of stress, we're also gonna transform the always boring cucumber into something that's actually exciting. And I know that is hard to believe, but it's true, as you will hopefully find out. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our cucumbers. And by prepping, we mean smashing. And the variety I'll be forcibly flattening today is the English cucumber, which is my favorite choice for this since the skin is very thin and tender and not too bitter. But having said that, any variety of cucumber you like to eat will work here. And what we'll do before we start smashing is cover this with a piece of plastic so as to hopefully minimize potential splattering. And then once that cucumber is covered, all we need to do is smash it flat using any kind of flat heavy object. Like for example, this meat pounder. Okay, other popular choices would be the flat of a cleaver or even a small pot or pan. It really doesn't matter as long as our cucumber gets smashed as shown. So you decide. You are after all the Gallagher of which smashing tool you prefer. And then what we'll do once our cucumber's been successfully smashed flat is unwrap it and cut it up into smaller pieces which I'm gonna make, I don't know, about an inch to an inch and a half wide. And of course, you know the drill. The exact size doesn't really matter, as long as you pick a size and stick with it. And in case you're wondering, the reason we smash the cucumbers is threefold. Okay, we're doing it for appearance and texture, but most importantly, we're doing it for flavor. Since believe it or not, if we smash our cucumber before we cut it, it will actually have a different and what many people consider a better flavor than if we didn't. 
Okay, a good analogy would be how we prep our garlic for aioli, where instead of slicing or chopping, we actually crush the garlic, which ends up bringing out a lot more flavor. So while not exactly the same, that's sort of what's going on here. But anyway, I went ahead and smashed and cut up two English cucumbers, at which point we're going to want to transfer those into some kind of strainer set over a bowl. Because the next step, while not as fun as smashing, is almost as important. And what that entails is sprinkling over some sugar and salt over our cucumbers. And then taking a spatula and mixing that very well. And then what we're going to do once these three ingredients are combined is set that in the fridge for anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes. And during that time, the sugar and salt is going to draw liquid out of the cucumbers, which will drain into the bowl below. And that's going to accomplish two things that I will cover later when we pull this out of the fridge. So for now, let's just go ahead and transfer that into the fridge for, like I said, between 30 and 60 minutes. And while we're waiting, we can go ahead and mix up our dressing. And no, to answer your question, I do not get free beer sent to me because I show it in my fridge. Not that I wouldn't. I'm looking at you, every beer company in America. But anyway, we'll pop that in the fridge and move on to the dressing. And we'll start with some crushed garlic in a mixing bowl. And then to that, we will add some rice vinegar, as well as a little bit of soy sauce. And then we'll finish up with the last two ingredients, which are a little touch of sesame oil. And that is a key ingredient here, so don't skip that. And then let's finish up with some chili flakes. And my favorite variety to use for this is Korean chili flakes, since there's no seeds. Plus, they're not too spicy, which is why I'm not adding any cayenne. Okay, don't forget, we're making this a serve next to hot, smoky, maybe spicy meats. So not only do we want that contrast in temperature, but we also don't want the spice level fighting with whatever we pair this with. But regardless, no matter what chili you decide to use, all we need to do is give this a quick whisk, and that's it. It is ready to dress our cucumbers with. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and pull those out of the fridge and see what they look like about 30 minutes later. And as predicted, that salt and sugar has drawn a lot of liquid out of the cucumbers, which not only is going to improve the texture and concentrate the flavor, but also apparently a lot of the stuff that makes a cucumber bitter is in that liquid. So mission accomplished. And we can now go ahead and transfer our drained cucumbers into our dressing. And we will go ahead and give that a mix. And theoretically, as soon as this is all combined, and we've tasted and adjusted for seasoning, we can, if we want, go ahead and serve this immediately. Which, according to many smashed cucumber salad aficionados, is the best way to go. However, other cucumber smashers, such as myself, think it's better to leave this in the fridge for about 30 minutes, so that our cucumbers have enough time to mingle with the dressing. So that's what I do. After mixing and tasting for seasoning, I'll go ahead and wrap that up, and pop it in the fridge for about 30 minutes, and maybe even give it a toss while it sits. And I'll probably touch on that in the blog post. I mean, I gotta write about something. But either way, whether you let this sit in the fridge for a little while or serve it immediately, we will go ahead and transfer that into some kind of serving container. And then one optional step, I like to grab a spoon and spend about 15 minutes moving around individual pieces of cucumber so that they look perfect for the pictures. And then once that's said, I do like to spoon over a little extra dressing. Although a lot of the experts say to serve it drained, I always like to have a little something at the bottom to dip in. And then last but not least, we will finish up with some toasted sesame seeds. And that's it, our smashed cucumber salad is ready to enjoy. Which is probably best done with a fork. But I decided to go ahead and impress you with my chopstick game, which is pretty strong. Don't let the fact that I stabbed that first one throw you off. But regardless, no matter how you decide to get this up to your face, you are going to be very glad you did. Okay, obviously this is cold. And thanks to the salt and sugar and the draining time, nice and crisp. But above and beyond the temperature and texture, the flavors here are so bright and fresh and vibrant and addictive, it's actually hard to eat slow. Unless, of course, you're using chopsticks. But anyway, the point is, this is shockingly delicious. And all thanks to a little bit of smashing. Of course, having said that, only a crazy person is going to sit and eat a whole bowl of cucumber salad by itself. So once this video ends, I want you to start brainstorming exactly what you're going to serve this with. And I'll give you one idea to get you started. And that would be some beautiful, sticky, smoky, barbecued baby back ribs. So that really was an amazing pairing, as are so many other things that are going to come off your grill this summer. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Grilled mahi-mahi with a spicy Thai chili mango sauce. Man, do I love mango combined with grilled meats, especially fish. 
So let me show you this really simple, beautifully summery condiment. So I'm going to take a ripe mango. I'm using what's called a manila mango. Very beautiful. Regular mango will work. I'm going to go around with my peeler, taking off the skin. Man, this thing was so perfectly ripe. And then instead of slicing it, I'm going to go ahead and just keep peeling the actual flesh of the mango. And that's going to make all these beautiful thin strips of mango meat. And once I peel all the available fruit from the mango, and you know mangoes, they have that weird kind of oval flat pit in the middle. Once I get all the fruit I can off there, I'm going to squeeze some of the juice down. Then I'm going to take a sharp knife or cleaver, and I'm going to mince it up. And if you're thinking of cheating and using a food processor to just puree this, do not do it. There's a reason we're mincing this up. There's a reason we peeled those thin, thin slices with the peeler. We want this to look like a puree, but we want it to be made up of lots and lots of millions of little pieces of chopped mango that are still together. All right, there's obviously going to be a lot of juice involved, but we want that integrity of the fruit. If you puree this, it will kind of look the same in the ramekin, but it won't be the same, I don't think. And I'm not going to take any chances. Do it this way. That took like a minute, so big deal. And besides, you don't have to clean the food processor, so you're welcome. All right, so once my mango was all prepped, I threw it in a bowl. And then because this is called a Thai chili mango sauce, I took one of these Thai chilies, and are these hot? Extremely dangerously hot, especially if you're using the seeds like I am. So I only used literally half of that tiny chili pepper. And by the way, feel free to substitute the chili of your choice. So I minced that up super fine. And again, it maybe was a half a teaspoon worth. I threw that in. I threw in some garlic. I threw in some sambal, which is an Asian chili sauce. We use a lot. We love it around here. I'm going to put in some fresh squeezed lime. Always a beautiful combination with mango. And then for some more acidity and sweetness and a little bit of saltiness, some seasoned rice vinegar. Give that a stir and let that sit for at least 30 minutes before you serve it. Why? Because all those ingredients have kind of big personalities. And just like a party, when you have a whole bunch of big personalities in the room, it might take a little while for everyone to get along. So let that sit, let that mingle, let that develop. All right, so I'm going to wrap that. I'm going to put it in the fridge. When I'm ready to serve, I'm going to chop up some fresh cilantro. Also, basil, very beautiful. Also, mint, very beautiful. So any of those three herbs will work. I'm going with cilantro here. I'm going to give that a mix. And there you go. Just a beautiful, beautiful sauce. I transfer it to my serving ramekin. Taste-wise, texture-wise, Visually, just, I think it's beautiful. And you can see all those little separate pieces of mango along with the juice, as opposed to a puree, as we've already covered. Now, sorry for the false advertising. This is not a video on how to grill mahi-mahi. So maybe I'll do a demo on that. But you know what? You can grill mahi-mahi, or salmon, or tuna, or any kind of other firm flesh fish, like swordfish would be great. And this would be perfect on it. This was about an inch thick piece, so it just took you know, three or four minutes per side. All right, so you can do that. If that's a little dark for your taste, no problem. Don't call it grilled mahi-mahi. Call it blackened mahi-mahi. Who'll know the difference? The other cool thing, this is literally good on anything that would come off your grill. Name something, go ahead. Yes, it would be good with that. Whatever you just said, it will be delicious with that. And there you go. Beautiful, juicy, tender fish with that spicy, brilliantly, brightly flavored mango sauce. I love this. So I really hope you give this a try. Go check out foodwishes.com for more information and all the ingredients, as usual. And as always, enjoy. Beef jerky! That's right, I like my beef snacks like I like my humor. Dry, a little spicy, and hopefully grass-fed. And if you've never tried making this at home before, I think you're going to be pretty surprised just how easy it is. So let's go ahead and get started with what's basically a simple two-step process. We're going to marinate and then dehydrate. So first up, we're going to make our top secret marinade. And by top secret, of course, I mean this is what pretty much everyone uses. So we will start off with a whole bunch of Worcestershire sauce. Nailed it. And then we'll also add an equal amount of soy sauce. 
So those two things make up the majority of this mixture. But of course, we're going to need some additional flavorings and seasonings. So we're also going to add a whole bunch of freshly ground black pepper and some smoked paprika. A lot of people like to use liquid smoke in beef jerky, but I don't. I'm not a big fan of that flavor. So I'm going to go with the paprika, which is going to give a more subtle smokiness. Plus, I really like what that does to the appearance when this is dried. So some smoked paprika. And then we'll also heat things up a little bit with some cayenne. And then just for good measure, I also added some red chili flakes. I'm using Aleppo, but any red chili flake will do. Then I'm also going to add a little bit of garlic powder, as well as some onion powder. And I said powder, not salt. That is just pure dried and ground garlic and onion. And then last but not least, we do need a little bit of sweet to balance the salt and heat. So I'm going to add a little bit of honey. So people like white sugar, some people use brown sugar, molasses, things like that. But I'm a honey guy. And then we'll take a whisk and we'll mix that thoroughly. And that is it for the marinade. So that's what I'm going to put in mine. Obviously, if you feel like adding more exotic seasonings and spices into yours, go for it. All right, you're the boss of how quirky to make your jerky. But this is what I'm going with. And once that stuff's mixed up, we'll just set it aside while we prepare our beef. Which, by the way, is already done. Because we had the butcher do it for us. Don't try to be a hero and cut this yourself. Go to the butcher and tell me you want a couple pounds of thinly sliced top round. And while you can make beef jerky out of just about any cut, for me this one works the best. It's relatively lean but does have a little bit of marbling to it. It's also very affordable. And because of the shape of the muscle, the butcher is going to be able to do nice, wide, thin slices for you. So I'm going with top round. And of course on the blog post I will give you very specific specifications. And then what we want to do is marinate our beef in that mixture for at least three hours. And I do like to dunk the beef in one piece at a time, so I know every piece is going to be coated. Because if you just dump this all in at once, the beef can kind of get knotted up and folded up. And you might get a section or two that aren't getting soaked as much as the others. So I do like to make sure each piece gets an even dunking before the whole thing gets wrapped and popped in the fridge. And by the way, conventional wisdom is to marinate this much longer. Like overnight or 24 hours. But I don't think that's necessary. I actually prefer my beef jerky with only a 3 or 4 hour marinade. Which is another thing we're going to talk about on the post. I actually did an experiment, a three hour marinated batch versus a 24 hour marinated batch, and the results were fascinating. So check that out. And obviously if you want to save space, you could transfer this to a zip top bag. But I had room, I'm just gonna leave it in the bowl, like I said, for just three hours. At which point we're gonna transfer that onto some paper towels, because before we dehydrate this in the oven, we want to remove as much of that excess moisture as possible. So place it down on some paper towel, and then put some over the top and press down, removing as much of that excess marinade as possible. And then once we've dried off our beef as best we can, we will transfer that onto a baking rack set over a sheet pan. And you're gonna to wanna to arrange these so you can get on as many as you can without them overlapping. Now the edges can touch, they just can't be on top of each other. So just move stuff around until it fits, kind of like a jigsaw puzzle or a jerk saw puzzle if you prefer. And by the way, I'm only doing one pan at this point because like I just mentioned, I did wanna experiment with letting the rest marinate overnight. But anyway, we're gonna pan those up at which point we will place that in a 175 degree oven for about three or four hours or until your beef is completely dry. And during that time, one quick tip, maybe once or twice an hour if you can remember, just walk by the oven and open the door and air it out a little bit. All right, that's gonna let some of that moisture escape from the oven, get some nice fresher, drier air in there. And like I said, we'll cook that at 175 for about three or four hours until it's completely dry and looks like this. It should really look like leather. And not that new shiny Fifty Shades leather. We're talking old shoe leather. So this is what mine looked like after about three and a half hours. As I mentioned earlier, I don't like the liquid smoke. I prefer the smoked paprika for the subtle flavor. And I think it gives that surface a really gorgeous appearance. So not only is this going to feel and taste good, it should look pretty good too. And of course, once your beef jerky is completely dry, it's ready to cut up and eat. And I'm going to borrow a technique that I learned from my good friend, whom I've never met, Alm Brown, who I saw use scissors to cut this up. And I thought, that's a good idea. So we'll cut ours into some bite-sized pieces. And that really was some delicious beef jerky. Just far superior in taste and texture to anything you're going to get in a supermarket. And once we have that all cut up, you can just keep it in some kind of airtight container. So I'm going to use one of these latch top jars for a slightly fancier and more hipster-friendly presentation. And no, you don't have to refrigerate this. Because of the salt content and the fact it's dry, this stuff should be very shelf-stable. And I know it's still a ways away, but my wife Michelle commented on what a great Father's Day gift this could make. In fact, let's take a quick poll of all the dads out there. What would you rather get for Father's Day? A tie or a big jar of this? Yep, that's what we thought. But anyway, that's it. Homemade beef jerky. Virtually identical to what you would get at a convenience store, except it has like 27 less ingredients. All right? 
So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Fried sweet plantains. That's right. One of my favorite meatless meals of all time is fried plantains with some beans and rice. So simple, so satisfying, so delicious. And I bet a lot of you have never even tried plantains, even though they're pretty much available in any big American grocery store. So the first thing you need to know about plantains is that they're not all the same. All right, so the darker, the blacker, the plantain, the sweeter it's gonna be. This green one here hardly has any sugar at all. Okay, very starchy, closer to a, you know, a potato than a piece of fruit. And as it ripens, it turns yellow, then black, and the darker it is, the sweeter it is. So you can get these jet black. I prefer it sort of this color, almost black. Because I'm gonna eat this as a savory dish, like a dinner with beans and rice, I don't want something that's like dessert sweet. So no, when you pick out your plantain, the darker it is, the sweeter it will be. All right? Okay, so prepping it very easy. I'm gonna take a knife, cut off the ends, make a little cut down the side here, peel off the peel, and then you have lots of options on how to cut this. You could just cut it simply in rounds across that way. You could cut it down the middle and saute the halves or quarters. But what I like to do, which I think looks pretty cool, is take my knife at a, like a 45 degree angle or even maybe a little more severe and make like half inch diagonal cuts like that. And I think that fries up real nice and looks cool, okay? So that's how I'm gonna cut mine. I'm gonna trim the bottoms off those ends just so they sit flat. You don't have to do that. In fact, it's probably wasting. I probably shouldn't have done that. All right, in a non-stick heavy duty saute pan on a medium high heat, I'm gonna heat up some vegetable oil. I'm gonna put in my plantain slices and this could not be easier. I'm simply gonna cook these until golden brown, about four, five, six minutes per side, depending. Once they get sizzling here, I'm gonna turn the heat down to medium so they don't brown too fast. I wanna make sure they're nice and tender all the way through. Okay, now often you'll see these done in a lot more oil, like almost deep fried, which will cook faster, which works great, but I don't wanna use all that oil. So here I'm using just a couple tablespoons of vegetable oil. It takes a little longer to cook them and you gotta turn them, but you know, the trade-off is you don't have to use as much oil and it still comes out really, really nice. And don't be afraid to play with your food. A lot of chefs, oh, only turn it once, only no, don't keep moving it. Listen, it's our food. We're gonna play with it if we want. So don't be afraid to flip them around a few times. What you want is a nice, crusty, caramelized surface with a beautiful, tender, sweet middle, all right? So right there, I figured, hey, that's where mine are. I'm gonna stop and eat. So I took them off the stove. I put them on a plate with my beans and rice, just some simple black beans, white rice, little green onion. I like to drizzle on a little fresh lime, not shown here, but a nice pinch of salt's definitely recommended. And then you dig in. And what do they taste like? Depends on how dark they were. If you get the really black ones, they're sweet, almost like a banana. If you use the greener ones, they're really starchy. Like I said, almost like a potato. These, because I used something sort of in the middle, had the sweetness of maybe like a butternut squash, you know, in that range. Not super sweet, still pretty savory, but really, really delicious. And for a non-meat dinner, very, very satisfying and fulfilling. So anyway, there you go. Fried sweet plantains could not be easier. And if you live near any kind of large city, that has a big supermarket chain, you can find plantains. You've probably walked by them a million times and never even thought of buying them. You were probably like, what's up with those large banana things? Those are kind of scary. I will never try those because I don't like culinary excitement in my life. All right, don't be like that. Grab some plantains, make this dish, and you'll be very, very happy you did. Anyway, go check out foodwishes.com for all the ingredients. There's only a couple. And as always, enjoy. How to make your own homemade sports drink. That's right. Would you rather pay $2 a bottle for something that's artificially flavored, artificially colored, and probably not that great for you? Or one you can make yourself in just minutes using real ingredients for just pennies a bottle? I know it's a tough call, so don't answer yet. Why don't you think about it while I get started with what I like to call Greater Aid? 
And that's because it's just like Gatorade, only greater. And we will begin this incredibly easy formula by adding one cup of water to a kettle or pot. And yes, we are going to add a lot more water to this. But what we want to do is start with just one cup in which to dissolve our ingredients. The first of which would be our sweetener, in my case honey. And yes, if you want, you could certainly use regular sugar. But I do like the honey. And I think most people would agree it's probably better for you. In fact, the only people that think white sugar is just as healthy work for the sugar companies. And you have to admit, that's kind of a weird coincidence. But anyway, to do a sports drink, we're going to need some type of sweetener, as well as some type of salt. And personally, I'm going to recommend Himalayan pink salt, which is not only a pure salt with no additives, but it also contains lots of trace minerals that apparently your body would enjoy replacing. So we'll need to toss in some salt, preferably pink. And then next up, we're going to add one optional, but easy to find ingredient, a powdered calcium and magnesium supplement. And from what I hear, that stuff's great for your muscles and nervous system, among other things. So a little touch of the old calcium and magnesium powder. And then last but not least, we will add just a little touch of cayenne. No, not enough to taste, but still enough to work a little magic on your insides. And then what we'll do at this point is grab a whisk and bring this over to the stove and set that on low heat. And we will warm that up stirring until everything's dissolved, which is only going to take a minute. So we don't want this to simmer or boil. We simply want it to heat up. And how you'll know you're done is everything will be dissolved. And it should look something like this. And by the way, don't worry if you get a couple dark particles of the salt that never dissolve. Those are just rocks. And then what we'll want to do is let this cool down to room temperature while we pull together our fruit juices. So for this recipe, we're going to want one cup of any kind of fruit juice. Preferably freshly squeezed, please. So I'm going to start with some orange juice which as you can see, I'm straining to remove the pulp. I will admit orange juice pulp is my kryptonite, although it really doesn't sap my strength as much as it just annoys me. But anyway, my juice blend is going to start with some orange juice, to which I'm going to squeeze in a couple limes, as well as a couple nice juicy lemons. And people, please stop emailing me telling me to microwave the lemons first to make them juicier. Everybody knows that one. And like I said, we're going to want to end up with about a cup, or a little bit over, and then all we have to do to finish our Graterade is add our freshly squeezed juice to our sports drink base. We can also go ahead and dump in the rest of the water. And we will take a whisk and give that a stir. And believe it or not, that's it. Our homemade sports drink is done. And not only is this going to taste as good, if not better, even the color's pretty close. I mean, come on, that looks good enough to be mistaken for artificial. So above and beyond saving all that money, I really think you're going to love how this looks and tastes. And speaking of taste, let me go ahead and try a little. And fair warning, if you use the same ingredient amounts that I do, this will not be as sweet as the stuff from the store. Which works for me, because I think those things are way too sweet. But of course, if you want it sweeter, just add more sugar or honey or whatever you're using. You are the Barton Fink of your homemade sports drink. So feel free to adjust the sweetness, as well as the saltiness or amount of fruit juice for that matter. And of course, we could just store this in the fridge in a pitcher. Or better yet, fill up some plastic bottles so you can drink it on the go. Believe me, this is the video those big drink companies do not want you to see. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they send someone to pay me a visit. You know, to have a little chat, and possibly even neutralize me. Although that's probably a little dramatic. But anyway, the point is this is just really fast and easy to make. And as we've already discussed, you get a far superior product at a much, much cheaper price. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always... Enjoy.